morning to everybody. Thank you, Georg. I have to thank the organizers that they selected me to give a plenary talk. And I have to explain at the beginning that due to policy of this institution, there should be a talk dedicated to the public. This is why I cancelled most of mathematical formulas and I present the sort of a picture book about rigidity or movable or flexible structures. And uh, we have a few physical models taken from a collection of kinematics models at my university. In order to bring some structure into this huge field of flexibility and rigidity, I will talk about forward linkages, hypertide frameworks, and finally on polyhedra. First of all, if we pass a bridge, we expect that the bridge is rigid. That means the framework admits no self motion. The framework is a collection of points and connecting bars, and each bar is understood as a rigid body. So I don't address tensibility frameworks here where bars can expand or have a maximum length. And each knot is a revolute joint in the plane or a spherical joint in space. We know that geometry, the geometry of structure is a necessary condition, but by far it's not sufficient. You remember probably this catastrophe at the Mohandi Bridge in Genoa last August, but it was not the bad geometry that the material was there. So a geometric structure is called flexible if it admits the continuous movement without changing its inner metric, which means the length of the bars or the shape of the surfaces. And if it's not movable, then it's called rigid. It turns out that the borderline between flexibility and rigidity is not that strict as one would expect. We can defer, for example, global rigidity, which means that the shape is uniquely defined in space. Think of a triangle or a composition of triangles or in space of tetrahedra and the composition. We call it locally rigid if the realizations are isolated, but there are examples where one can switch between two realizations. We call this the flipping structure. And we speak of generically rigid if the combinatorial structure shows that in the generic case it is rigid independently of, it, of its metric. And there is an interesting new result which addresses the question if it is generically rigid, are there particular dimensions, lengths of bars or shapes of faces which admit a flexible structure? So actually, uh, this is an algebraic problem, and the question is if the resulting algebraic variety has little points, and interesting, there's also a combinatorial characterization of this. I'm beginning with a four-bar linkage. A four-bar linkage consists of a quadrangle. Uh, we have Regular charts and the vertices, it is in the plane. One side is fixed, the other side is called the coupler, and if we attach a point to this coupler, then this point traces a certain curve, which is called the coupler curve. We find big coupler forward linkages looking at these grains. They use a four bar, this one, because the end point moves 
approximately horizontal for a while, and so you have to lift or to sink down the, 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 the load, and forward linkages are very easy to produce, or they are somehow the simplest flexible structure because it consists of leverage joints. You find forward linkages also at this the links which you find, for example, in the kitchen, you have to look carefully to, to see the bars because the bars are curved, but here, for example, you see the two bars. I pass around these uh, examples, but they are more or less uh, rigid, so please have a listen. Four bars show also up or can show up at some auxetic structures, these are structures where which globally expand. We will have a lecture on this. If we add an additional bar, that means we connect this point attached to the couple with a fixed point, then actually we get a rigid structure because this distance that means only that C is movable on the circle. But we also note that there is a second point of intersection. And that means there is a second realization. And if this is sufficiently nearby, we get a, a flipping structure. Here is an example. We also see a rotational symmetry. This is one realization, and if I actually I come out from the plane, then I can rotate it and I get another position. Of course, it can happen that this circle is tangent to the coupler curve, and then we can imagine that it's slightly flexible. And this is what we call infinitesimally flexible. We have an example here, also due to symmetry. It, it flexes slightly, so it's not rigid. It's not infinitesimally rigid, how we can say, but it's infinitesimally flexible. And the exact solution is the following. We call it infinitesimally flexible if at e e to each point of the framework we can assign a velocity vector which is compatible with the infinitesimal constant of the length. And geometrically this means that the projections of this vector on the connecting line have the same length and same direction. It's an easy computation. You just differentiate the distance condition and you separate the two parts and then you get the two components for the point. And in fact, as you can see at this example, a infinitesimally flexible structure really admits slight movements. If we come back to this uh, structure we had before, starting with a coupler and fitting and att att attaching one point to another fixed point. We have two triangles and it's easy to see that this structure is infinitesimally flexible if these two triangles, the X and the Ys, are in a so-called Desarc position, so according to the Desarc theorem, or they can have this condition. In this case, this point goes to infinity. We could say the first derivative of the length is zero, but we can continue and can, for example, suppose that all uh, derivations are zero, or the function representing the length of the side has a zero of order k. 
This means, for example, second order means that also the acceleration vectors are compatible with the constant side. And geometrically, this means, for example, that there are equal angles or other conditions like equal lengths. We can even state the conditions for third order, infinitesimal flexibility, there, there must be a certain curve of uh, degree 3 be involved or an equilateral hyperbola. It turns out that uh, infinitesimal flexibility uh, shows up at various different topics. We find it in robotics. There are so-called singular poses, where, which should be avoided because if the end effector wants to pass with a constant velocity, then some articulated uh, lengths or some links for some articulation, the velocity goes to infinity. And we have also at global positioning such critical positions. Global position uh, relies on measuring the distances to satellites but actually, actually not the exact distances are measured, but only distances up to a common additive length. So we could say the difference of any two distances. This is what we exactly measure. And if it turns out that the satellites are all located on a cone of revolution, this is your position and S1 and so on, are the instant positions of the satellites, then it turns out that X can move slightly along the axis of the rotation center and the differences remain constant. This is why sometimes these GPS systems give a so-called geometric dilution of precision, an index which shows the precision. But usually, uh, if there are other satellites, then this doesn't show up as an error. But if all are located on the same cone, we still would have this, this lack of precision. We could ask if there is a special case of this mechanism or of this framework where there is a continuous flexibility. And the only case is more or less trivial. If the four bar is a parallelogram, then it moves like this. Each point traces a circle, and of course, you connect this point with the center of the circle, and you get it continuously. This shows a structure which consists of parallelograms. For example, if we fix this here, we can move this parallelogram and then also this parallelogram, so we get what is called the two-parametric motion of this bar. It remains parallel to itself. And we can say the same motion which is produced in this way could also be produced in this way. So we have a twofold decomposition. And the uh, surprising thing is you can find a position where all the bars are aligned. And there is a bifurcation possible. For example, I can switch to parallelograms in antiparallelograms. Then the degree of freedom is only one. So this has only one degree of freedom. But if also a second example of parallelograms are switched to antiparallelogram, then again we get as a composition of two antiparallelograms a two-parametric motion, so the degree of freedom is then again two. And it turns out that this one of the rather rare examples where a two-parametric motion admits two decompositions. There are up to 20 or less than 20 examples known in the plane and in space. And surprisingly, this antiparallelogram version works also in 
on the sphere, and it works in space if instead of the parallelogram you need banded isograms. Yes, so I can pass along this one. I tried to, to get four parallelograms switched into, into anti-parallelograms. You have to start with the aligned position, but I didn't find sufficient time to do this. There are other versions of continuously flexible structures related to a four-bar mechanism. We know that a coupler curve is a curve of degree six with triple points at the absolute points. That means we have three tangent lines at the two absolute points. And each tangent line at one point is complex conjugate to a tangent line at the other points. And so we get three real points. Two of them are the fixed points of the four bar. And it turns out also the third intersection point plays this role. One and the same curve is flexible, can be produced either by the yellow four bar or by the red four bar or by the blue four bar. Here, have, here we have a rather big model which shows the movement. So it's a one parameter motion. In kinematics we call this an over-constrained motion. And the design is made of an engineer uh, due to the following reason. Such over-constrained linkages are very sensitive against imprecisions because they, are, they work exactly if the precisions are correct. And therefore, he added an additional degree of freedom by let this point move. Actually, he doesn't move, but he has the possibility to move in this way. And the same here. And there is an interesting example where it turned out that it's important to have such additional degrees of freedom in case an overconstrained structure is moving. This is the so called Heureka polyhedron. It consists of regular triangles and they have special links here. These are links actually a combination of two revolute joints which keep the angle between the faces constant. So at every link, the angle between the two faces is constant. This model of large size, the side length is about six meter, was a sort of eye catcher at the science uh, exposition in Zurich, 1991. And I was told that during summer when this exposition was running several times, some of the plates have broken because of the tension inside, because of the overconstrained mechanism which is used here. Another interesting continuously flexible uh, structure combined with a four bar is the so-called Burmester mechanism. We have a moving four bar, and it turns out that there are points which can be connected with special points on the sides. The sides remain straight, and the mechanism is still flexible. It turns out, uh, this is something what uh, Dixon figured out, that the same angle shows up here and here. The reason behind is that in a four bar, for example, in, in this one, the cosines between opposite angles, let's say this angle and this angle, the cosines are in a linear relation, and this is actually trivial, you only need the cosine theorem. So that means this, the cosine of this angle is in a linear relation with this one, the cosine just changes sign, but it's almost the same here. 
and the same here, and you can manage that the linear relation is an identity, and this is if the angle is the same here and here. It turns out that the angles which show up here around F are equal to the interior angles in the four bar. And this shows that since the sum of angles is here 360, we have to have the same in the four bar. So this mechanism doesn't work on the sphere because we don't have uh, the, the sum is of interior angles is always smaller uh, than 360 in elliptic geometry. Nevertheless, uh, this mechanism can also be seen as a composition of two four bars. This is one four bar and we connect it with a second four bar. This gives a transmission from this bar to this bar. And in this particular case, the transmission from this bar via the two four bars to this bars is the same as it can be done by a single four bar. Actually, the transmission is of higher degree, but it splits, it is decomposable, and one component gives the same as this given four bar, the other uh, uh, component doesn't. The spherical analog or aspherical analog is related to a problem which has to do with these flexible or rigid structures uh, consisting of four quadrangles, of three by three quadrangles, which in some cases is flexible. It's called the Kokozakis mesh, and Ivan Dismestyev will report about his uh, classification of all the flexible cases. Also here we have actually at each corner, if we intersect it with a sphere, a spherical four bar. And the way from this to this, or from one link to the other link, is a composition of two four bars. And this composition of two four bars, spherical four bars, has to have a second decomposition. And if this works, then we have something flexible. Next, we come to a bipartite framework. At first, the planar bipartite framework. Here are three models. One is rigid, so you feel a slight mobility, but this is just caused by the clearance at the, at the links. One is flexible, and you really note that it can flex. And the other is actually flexible of order two, but the difference is not really noticeable. I pass this alone just to give you a feeling that infinitesimal flexity at a physical model really shows some mobility. It is not hard to prove that we have an infinitesimally flexible position if these three points are aligned and from geometry we know that this is Pascal theorem on conics. This is equivalent to the fact that the six points have to be located on a conic, which in this case is a hyperbola. If you remember at the four bar or this derived uh, structure, we had this Desarc configuration which characterizes infinitesimal mobility. Here we have a characterization by a conic. Both are of projective nature and it turns out, and this is a classical result, maybe due to Liebmann, but I'm not really sure about the first mention of this result, that infinitesimal rigidity is projectively invariant. And if a structure is infinitesimal rigid, then it's actually, 
infinitesimally flexible, then this works not only in Euclidean, but for example, also in hyperbolic geometry. And one uh, rather short and more visual proof is due to Bernd Wegner from Berlin. Think we have a planar infinitesimally flexible structure. That means we have in the plane the bars and the blue velocity vectors which satisfy uh, the projection uh, theorem. That means the components have equal lengths, this one and this one. And now we add an additional point outside. We keep it fixed, so the velocity vector is zero. And we add these green bars. And now we can lift the blue vector to a red vector, which is perpendicular to this green bar. The same here. So we could say the top view is the same as before, but we lift it. And now we see for this bar, the component, component of the zero vector is, of course, zero. And because of the orthogonality, also here it's zero. So the projection theorem is also valid for the green bars. And we can state that the spatial framework is infinitesimally flexible if and only if the planner is. And now think we just cut this spatial version, which has a sort of conical shape. We cut this with another plane. We get the collinear figure. And due to this uh, theorem, we can say also any other section of this fle infinitesimally flexible cone gives an infinitesimally uh, flexible uh, structure. We can also say about flipping bipartite frameworks, and they are related to Ivory's theorem. Ivory's theorem deals with confocal conics. And in these curved quadrangles, the diagonals have the same lengths. And this are, we can also spell this in another way. There is an affine transformation from the red one to the confocal one. This affine map maps points being located on the same hyperbola of this confocal family, and the diagonals are the same. And this works in any dimension and in Euclidean, elliptic, or hyperbolic geometry. And now think we have a bipartite framework. The points of the one type are on one parabola or conic. The other are on a confocal parabola. And now I switch. Points from outside go inside, vice versa. And what we get is a second configuration, a second realization. And at each, everywhere we see this length is the same as this length, and so on. So the lengths are preserved. And we can state this really uh, more general. If we have two incongruent realizations of bipartite frameworks in space of any dimension, then there is always, like the blue one and the red one, there is also always a movement which transports the red one in another version where there is this affine relation. Points from outside go inside, and those from inside go outside. If we think on, on the fact that this point goes outside and the other goes inside, and we think of the orthogonality here, we can imagine if the, if the two confocal conics come closer, the point moves orthogonally to the conic. And this is, in fact, true if we think of infinitesimal mobility in the case when the points are located on the conic. We see that one family of points goes inside with velocity vectors orthogonal to the conic, and the other go outside. There is a nice result and of Walter Whiteley. And most amazing is that the proof is just two lines, saying if 
we have a bipartite framework and the point, the knots are located on a conic, then this is always infinitesimally flexible. Points of one family have this velocity vectors, M is the symmetric matrix, so actually this is a vector orthogonal because it's orthogonal to the polar plane or to the tangent hyperplane. One goes outside and the other goes inside. The points P and Q are located on the quadric, so they satisfy this quadratic form. And if we check this projection theorem that we see uh, two terms rule out because of this, and the other uh, again because we have M as a symmetric matrix and one positive and one negative sign, and also the converse is true, so if, it's, if we have it infinitesimally flexible, then it must be related to a quadric. And there's another nice uh, result due to Walter Whiteley. And again, the simplicity of the proof surprises. I told you about flappy, uh, flipping mechanisms, so we have two realizations and maybe sufficiently nearby so that uh, we can switch from one pose into the other. And then Walter Whiteley proved that the mean, that means really take the midpoint between corresponding points everywhere, the mean gives a structure which is always infinitesimally flexible. So he called this averaging. Take the two poses, form the mean of corresponding vertices, and this is infinitesimally flexible. And vice versa, if you have an infinitesimally flex like here, you take the velocity vectors in both directions at each point and you get the green realization and the blue realization. And this is the proof. Actually, we have the realization on the left side and this is the distance for the realization with the primes on the right side. And I split it into this plus them and this minus them and interpret this and that's it. So snapping or flipping structures are always related to infinitesimally flexible structures and vice versa. So let's come to continuously flexible uh, structures originating from a bipartite framework due to Dixon at the end of the 19th century, really, uh, there are two continuously flexible examples we find here. Physical models of this, and it's not so easy to figure out why it is flexible if you just look at this. In one case, the two families of points are located on two orthogonal lines. Suppose this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis. And I transform the x-coordinates of the points by adding to the square a constant. And at the y-axis, I subtract the same constant from the y-coordinates. And then it's evident that this distance remains constant because at the square, we add the C and we subtract the C. And that's it. So if C is sufficiently small, this is flexible. Uh, and of course, you can add additional points on this line and this line, and the flexibility is not disturbed. And the other one is if we have, say, a rectangle of the red points and another rectangle of the blue points, and they have the same axis of symmetry, then this is also flexible. And this can be explained with Ivory's theorem because we have, we can find confocal conics, one through the red points, a confocal one to the blue point, and then we can switch 
the red point goes in and the blue point goes out. And this shows the continuous flexibility because if we have a rectangle, there is a one parameter set of conics, of blue conics passing through, and we always find one confocal one. So there is also a mechanism using these two rectangles, a 16 bar me mechanism. And here it is already sophisticated to figure out at which level you have to mount the, the, the bars because the danger of blocking themselves is, is great. This is sometimes called bottomless framework. And the same works on the sphere because Ivory's CRM works, for example, also on the sphere. I told about confocal quadrix and the affine transformation between any two if they are of the same type. For example, if we have a, a hyperboloid, there is a confocal one, and this affine transformation between confocal ones uh, preserves the lengths along the edges. And this is the reason why this structure moves. It moves from one focal ellipse uh, to another focal hyperbola. These are confocal conics, and the the joints have to be made rather carefully because they have to admit not only the rotation, but also a rotation along the axis. And this is realized here. There's another flexible structure, which is not that sophisticated, but it's amazing to see. It uses circular sections of an ellipsoid. And also, the, it is movable because you get a, a, a grid. If you look in this direction, this is just a parallelogram grid, so it's not that complicated, but it's compatible with ellipsoids. So this shows the flexions of the hyperboloid, and the same works with hyperbolic parabolas. So this is also a flexible structure and the surprising thing that the strings remain taut despite of the movement. So they are not from rubber, but they have to preserve the length during this movement. So uh, related to uh, such a hyperboloid is also the question if a double-sided pyramid, or in which case a double-sided pyramid, so I have a quadrangle and uh, two apices, in which case this is infinitesimally flexible, and one characterization is that four sides of the base are on a hyperboloid, and the remaining two apices denoted as y1, v2, are on the same hyperboloid. So this is the geometric characterization. So finally, a few words about polyhedra, about flexible polyhedra. We know that if a polyhedron is given, we find it's, it's unfolding a flat form which shows the metric. And the procedure is unique except you can locate, of course, the different polygons somewhere in the plane. And you need an appointment which face is adjacent to which face. The way in the other direction is more complex, and it turns out it needs not give a unique result. So the metric needs not give a unique form in space. Let's include a small exercise if we do it in four dimensions. I shift the cube orthogonal to the three space where I am into the fourth dimension, and I take the length of the translation segments equal to the side length of the cube. I get this, a hypercube. 
And then I can imagine that the faces of the hypercubes, these are eight cubes, can be rotated back iteratively in the original space and I get something which could be called the unfolding of the hypercube. And the amazing thing, Salvador Dali used this unfolding. He called it corpus hypercubus. And you really find the unfolding of the hypercube and Christ in a rather uncomfortable pose along this hypercube. So this was a, sm a small excursion into art. So it's known that Salvador Dali was really interested in, in geometry and also in higher uh, ge dimensional geometry. So I, I was speaking about the reverse pro uh, way from the development back to the spatial form. And due to Danilovich uh, Alexandrov, we know that if the spatial form is convex, then for each convex metric, there is a unique convex counterpart. And convex metric means that at each vertex, the sum of intrinsic angles of adjacent surfaces is less to 360 degree. This is the famous uniqueness theorem. And we got an algorithm by Bobenko and uh, Ivan Ismestiev, which really constructs this uh, corresponding spatial form. But if we don't insist on the convexity and we have the development that it's easy to see, we can produce a snapping polyhedron. The development, the net is the same. We put on a cube a small pyramid and you can put this inside or outside. So this is again a flipping form. Actually also a regular octahedron it meets continuous flexibility. You have to put the upper pyramid into the lower pyramid, so this is two folds covered. And then this is an open pyramid, and such a four side pyramid is flexible because we have four faces meeting together. So we can again see in a spherical uh, four bar mechanism here. But you can even fold it and you get only two faces and we still have a degree two, a degree one of freedom. So concerning this uh, converse uh, problem, giving the development and found the spatial form, there are some milestones in the development. I reported about Alexandrov. Raoul Bricard, even at the end of the 19th century, figured out that there are flexible octahedra, and octahedron means uh, a double-sided, a, a double pyramid with a four-sided base. Bob Connolly showed that there is a flexing sphere because these flexible octahedra all have self-intersections, and Bob Connolly was the first who came up with a flexible uh, polyhedron without self-intersections. And Richard Sabitov uh, showed that, so he proved a, a famous conjecture, the so-called Bellows conjecture. He proved that if we have a flexible polyhedron, exactly a triangulated polyhedron, then the volume stays constant during the flex. And the proof consists in an algorithm to show that there is a polynomial of a rather high and actually uncertain degree. He just gave an algorithm. A polynomial and the volume or the squared volume is one root of this. And we just have to figure out. And the coefficients depend on the combinatorial structure and on the edge lengths. And of course, if you have a flexible polyhedron, the polynomial remains the same and we have only a finite number of roots and so there must be, it must stay constant because the flex is continuous. There is another famous example 
which seems to move, but you see at this example, there is a hole in it because it must change the volume. We have two flat positions, and so it has to press when, when moving, and this shows exactly this can't be an exact movement B. Also, this was once exposed as a flexible polyhedron. It has two flat poses at one end and at the other end. This shows the development. And for a long time, we could see at Wolfram Math World that this is a flexible polyhedron, but a few years ago, it had been corrected. It is only, it admits two poses or three poses. And one of the mean poses is also infinitesimally flexible. And this gives the impression that it's really inflexible. So there are, as I told before, uh, due to this result of Bricard, continuously flexible octahedra. But they have self-intersection, nevertheless. There are examples, but you have to look carefully at two triangular faces in total, we have eight faces. This shows six faces only. Two triangles are omitted because of the self-intersection. And then it's flexible, and it shows even two flat poses. And there's another example which shows even more mobility because you can flex it also this way. This shows the development of another flexing sphere uh, due to Stefan, which is just a compound of two Bricard octahedra. And this shows the development of the most complicated Bricard octahedron. It's type 3. But I will skip the following pages. Yeah, I want to mention that there is also a flexible octahedron or a double pyramid with two vertices at, at infinity. And this is the only flexible version with vertices and at, ex, uh, at infinity. And due to Georg Navratil, uh, it is flexible and it has no self-intersection. So this is an advantage. But on the other hand, the vertices are at infinity. This type 3 is the most complicated, but from the algebraic point of view, it's the simplest because at each vertex uh, you have a sort of antiparallelogram and, and there is the transmission function, simpler or uh, it, uh, uh, decomposable. It was a long-standing problem if we have flexible polyhedra if we can continue this sequence of flexible polyhedra in higher dimensions, uh, in the analog in four dimensions and higher is called cross polytop. There existed or have already been known uh, examples of flexible cross polytopes in four dimensions, but Alexander Geifulin with one stroke showed at once that there exist. I had the conjecture that they don't exist, but Alexander Geifulin could prove that they exist in all dimensions and in the elliptic and in uh, hyperbolic uh, uh, geometry as well. And also another remarkable result is due to Alexander Geifulin. He showed that such a Sabitov polynomial exists also in four dimensions and also it exists in all arbitrary dimensions. So that means the Bellows conjecture is also valid in the n-dimensional space. So uh, just maybe two minutes. Uh, rigidity of structures can also be studied at continuous surfaces. And here we have the same uh, problem. Sometimes uh, these surfaces have a development. They can be developed in the plane. 
and often it's hard to figure out the corresponding spatial form, so a physical model shows immediately what comes out. And this is one example. You maybe know this type of boxes. Sometimes McDonald's used it to pack apfelstrudel or something. And in this case, it is possible to figure out exactly what is coming out. It turns out that these curves are not arcs of ellipses, but they are meridians of surfaces of revolution of constant Gauss curvature. So in this case, we can figure out the exact shape. In another case, it isn't. This is the parcel for collecting the keys. The development looks like this. It consists of two half arcs, and the length of the straight segments equals the length of the half arc. And you fold it together by pasting together the half arc with the adjacent segment, and the same here. And here it's really a hard job to figure out how the shape, uh, the spatial form looks like. The problem is you have no information. It must be a developable ruled surfaces, but you have no information about the position of these generators. It turned out that it, we get a very good approximation starting with cones and then with the cylindrical surfaces, which looks like this, but nevertheless, there is a small theoretical error, so that shows that it's not a cylinder in between, but an arbitrary torus, but we can only expect a numerical solution. But this ends my presentation. Thank you for listening. I forgot to show this object, which is also a, flapping, a flipping one. Yes, so this is a long, long history. The institute collected in the past, uh, past a lot of models. At the end of 19th century, there were commercial companies, for example, Teubner, who produced models for mathematics, and among them also a series of uh, models, uh, of kinematic models. Yeah. Yes, it sh it should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it should be. Yeah, because it's actually it it can be proved also uh, with with Ivory's theorem or looking at a limit and and Ivory works in the sphere as well. Yeah. Yes, it should be. Thank you.